Some say that alongside this see-it-to-believe-it world is the shadowy realm of the supernatural. Sometimes the residents of that dimension touch us, and in one moment, our lives are changed forever. America's Lady of Supernatural Thrillers, Mary Ann Pohl, is your real ghost chatter host. On this podcast, you'll hear stories by real people who have seen real ghosts. Once in a while, Mary Ann will podcast a tale taken from the genre she loves best, the supernatural. Welcome to today's Real Ghost Chatter episode. Have you heard about Anchor? If you haven't, I'm here to tell you it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free, and I mean free. I haven't paid a dime to produce or distribute my podcasts. There's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. How easy is that? Podcast distribution can be a headache, but not with Anchor. Anchor distributes your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many, many more. As a bonus and not an obligation, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Anchor has everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. I'm Marianne Paul, America's Lady of Supernatural Thrillers and a charter member of a wonderful group of writers, author masterminds, and of course your host on Real Ghost Chatter. If you'd like to know more about me or my books, visit my website at www.marynpoll.com. You can find out more about Author Masterminds at authormasterminds.com. In this episode, I finish reading the short story entitled Unintentional Consequences. As I said as an intro to the last episode, this story introduces my third book, Gorgon. All of the Iconoclast thriller series start with a short story. Each of these prologues is set in the past and relates to the present day setting of the main novel. I hope you will enjoy hearing it as much as I enjoyed writing it. I hope actually you enjoy it more than I enjoyed writing it. A shaky a breath escaped Solak's lips. He lifted stone gray eyes to Elder Sean. Why have you stopped? The youth leader demanded. Because the next part of the story came to young Nicholas in a vision. It has been treated as the gravings of a crazy man. Since no one can refute it, I feel obligated to tell you. It may help you understand why your land is cursed. Here is what Nicholas said. After the Count entered the cave of curses, he set the jar on a ledge surrounded by pointed rocks growing down from the cavern's roof. The drip from each dagger-shaped outcropping echoed several times when they snapped to the floor. I could smell the water and mud. Alexander placed a Bible in front, behind, and to each side of the jar. He left the golden belt in place. Then he prayed. As your son once prayed, O God, I pray you take this cup from me. But if you will not, then take me home to be with you and Jesus when I am spent. Your will, not mine, be done. His back to the jar, Varlam knelt, closed his eyes, and waited. He was so deep in prayer he did not hear the jar vibrate. He didn't see the inky blue light it emitted. He did not witness the golden belt burst into flames and dissolve, or the rock on which the jar rested quake just enough for the Bibles to slide to the floor. No, he didn't see or hear any of this. The lid separated from its base. The black mist snaked out of the vessel and enveloped the Count. By God's mercy, I don't think he felt the pain of death, but he might have heard the words of the spirit before he fell unconscious. Foolish, foolish being. The thing gurgled as it swallowed the last of Count Alexander's lifeblood. Then it opened its mouth and sang a seductive melody. The vision faded when Nicholas heard the melody. He thought the Count was calling for help. He ran toward the cave, but a large earthquake knocked him to the ground. When the quake passed, the boulders and rocks covered the entrance. He banged the blockage with his fists. Count Alexander, Nicholas screamed. 
he scurried up the rocks wedged in the cave's doorway and spotted a small hole. He threw himself flat against the hard earth and squinted into the darkness. The mutilated and lifeless body of Count Alexander were directly beneath him. Nicholas watched a trail of ebony mist slither into the urn before he ran for town. Some of the townspeople followed Nicholas to the site and climbed the small hill. They confirmed the Count's death to the rest of the town. It was reported to the authorities of the land the Count had died in a cave-in during an earthquake. Salak shook his head. This is where most think the story ended, but like all who have an insatiable craving, the people of the town longed for the jar's return. Many said it was calling to them. Some of the town's men made a plan to clear the rock slide and retrieve the urn. If several God-fearing men in town had not come together to pray for God to intervene, I believe the jar would have been recovered and the village destroyed. These brave souls agreed the vessel would be taken to an uninhabited place so that none could be tempted by this destruction again. But this is my opinion. I will let the story speak for itself. On a moonless night, this small band of brave men, which included young Nicholas, set out for the cave. Along the way, they talked about the murders. Somehow, they realized the killings happened only in darkness, and this thing hated light. They timed the removal of the last rocks in the daylight hours. Light flooded the cave. Nicholas hurried to the jar and slid the Holy Bible under its base. He wrapped both in a burlap sack, stuffed them into a chest, and slammed the top. I will take this evil thing far away from our land, he said. I will travel across the great water to a place where no people live and bury it there. Nicholas's hatred of the spirit kept him to his word. When he heard of the Russian's exploration of the ocean we now know is between Russia and your land, Nicholas made his way to a place called Akach. The explorer's ships set sail from there. Like many from my land, Nicholas believed the unexplored lands were only inhabited by animals. He found favor with a man named Waxel, who was second only to the great explorer Bering on the ship named the St. Peter. Waxel made the way for young Nicholas to join the crew. Two ships, the St. Paul and the St. Peter, sailed from Russia in the summer of the year my people call 1741. Because these vessels were named after the great leaders of his faith, Nicholas saw this as a sign from God. The ships traveled many days and then were separated. The one he was on, St. Peter, was alone for many more days without sighting land. The captain decided to head back to Russia. The many months at sea had taken its toll. The crew was falling ill. Some had already died. When Nicholas received word they were returning to Russia, terror gripped his heart. He had not disposed of the urn. Now it would be returning to his land. Visions of Count Alexander's mangled body assaulted his mind. Better I die than return this abomination to my home. Nicholas snagged a rope, tied the box around his waist, and prepared to jump overboard. He made his way to the bow of the St. Peter. He picked up the pace when he saw several explorers heading toward him. He caught enough bits and pieces of the conversation to realize they were planning for an excursion. How can you go on a trip to explore in the water? Nicholas asked. Where have you been? Sighted land hours ago. They laughed at the young ship hand. New hope filled Nicholas. He quickly formulated a plan. I've always wanted to explore. Is there any way I could come too? The explorer called Afon said, Now, why would we bring a scruffy kid? You'd be a rock around our necks. Nicholas straightened his back and looked the older man in the eye. I have been on this ship for months. I am strong. I can help carry your bags and instruments. You will have more strength to explore if I do this. Afon grinned. You have courage. I just want to see the world too. This isn't a party scruff. It's dangerous. You could get eaten. Even worse, you could fall off a cliff and not be found. You would die a slow and painful death from hunger and thirst. Doesn't scare me. Afon focused on Nicholas for the first time. I'll talk to the others. A thin smile touched Nicholas's mouth. He stood straight as an arrow while the explorers talked among themselves. Well, it wasn't easy, but they agreed. If you didn't remind me so much of myself at your age, I wouldn't have argued for you. Don't let me down, Afon said. God willing, I won't. Then it is settled. Be here before daybreak. We won't wait. Nicholas made his bed by the explorer's rowboat. For the first time since he sailed from Russia, he slept. His eyes popped open at the sound of footsteps heading to the small boat. Hey, we have a rat. Someone get the hook. 
one of the explorers barked. Nicholas skittered to the corner, hugging the chest. Afon lowered his hook and let out a sharp laugh. Wait, it's just the scruff who wants to be an explorer. Must have slept in the boat all night so he didn't get left. Afon jerked his chin at Nicholas. Make yourself useful, and let's get this boat in the water. When the boat reached shore, Nicholas jumped out and almost dragged it to the sand single-handed. He helped the other men bring their supplies to the island. While they readied for the exploration, he excused himself, citing a need for privacy. He hurried into the woods, believing he would come upon the right place to conceal the cursed burden and be back with the explorers before they missed him. But Nicholas wandered too far, looking for the perfect hiding spot. He lost track of time. When he reached a meadow, the angle of the sun made his heart jump. He looked around. Nothing was familiar. The sound of screeching birds and chattering squirrels were all he could hear. Even those sounds weren't familiar. What am I to do? Nicholas plopped down under a large spruce, opened the box, and stared at the jar. It began to glow. The deep indigo blue made him forget where he was. He only wanted to stare at the color forever. He slammed the lid. Leaves rustled to his left. His eyes flew to a stand of trees. A man leapt from behind some alders. For the second time in a day, Nicholas felt like a trapped animal and skittered backward. A dark-skinned man walked forward, spear held up toward the sky. Please don't hurt me, Nicholas squeaked. The native stopped and tilted his head to the left. He ran forward. Terror seized Nicholas and he fainted. When he awoke, Nicholas was in an earthen hut, lying several feet from a crackling fire under an animal skin. Several strange men sat at the door. Nicholas sprang to his feet. His eyes darted around the room until they came to rest on the wooden box, still beside him. He crumpled to the floor. You see, Nicholas had fainted from illness more than fear. The scurvy was going through the ship, and it caught up with him. Those natives took him from Kadayak and to their home to heal him. He did gain enough strength to eat and live among the people. As you can imagine, they could not talk to each other. He speaking Russian. He began drawing pictures. They responded to him, eyes sparkling with humor at his attempts to talk very loud while drawing. Somehow though, they taught him some of their words. They became his friends. None asked Nicholas about the box. They accepted it as his prize because they were an honest people. Nicholas insisted on participating in the next hunt. His new friends shook their heads at his stubbornness. You see, he breathed hard when he walked through the forest by the village. They knew he was not strong enough to hunt and told him no. He begged them until they agreed. On the way to the hunting grounds, his friends told Nicholas of their legends. Nicholas was at peace, listening to their tales while walking through the deep forests and beside the big water. He almost forgot the box. He was happy for the first time in years. But then his friends told him the legend of a cursed place. When they passed a dark, treed gully, he was told, do not go in there. Why? It is cursed. It belongs to the evil ones. Do not go in there or you will become one of them. I will not go in, he answered. His heart leapt. This is the place, he thought. It is already cursed. No one will come near and this thing will not harm anyone else. Nicholas sneaked back to the cavern. He kept his word and did not go in. At the head of the ravine, he found what he had been searching for. A mammoth tree stirred partially hidden by saplings and brush. It had split in its center the size of the jar. He yanked the box open, shoved the jar through the hollow, and stuffed dead leaves and sticks into the opening. In the name of Jesus, may this tree become a prison for the evil spirit in this jar. Thank you, God, for bringing me here. Thank you. Nicholas made the sign of the cross, turned, and ran from the tree. The creak of wood brought him to a stop. He looked back. His eyes grew wide. The leaves and sticks snaked together and formed tight bars over the hole. The tree shook. Its leaves withered and died until the only thing left was a gnarled trunk with a top knot of green. Nicholas witnessed the shriek of rage when the being realized it could not leave its prison. But he did not hear the curse the spirit yelled at him, nor did he hear the response and the curse issued by a demon high in the command of Satan, one who had claimed this gorge as his home and whose home had been vandalized. The scurvy returned and Nicholas died a few feet from the ravine. This tree stands at the entrance to a gorge close to Tukatnu. 
It is the ravine you know is cursed. You have done a horrible thing by not telling my grandfather and his people sooner. But if the place were already cursed, why do you tell us now? The people will not go near it. I know this place and the taboo, and I am young. What is done is done. The story is not quite over. How could it get any worse? The people of Nicholas's village were enraged when they discovered their beloved object had been taken away. Most of those townspeople listened to the men of God and, although angry, accepted the truth and reasoning for the vessel's disappearance. It should have ended there. It did not. Some of them still burned with the hunger the evil spirit had put in them. A group of these men made it their life's work to find the urn. Several set out to the south. They created a story to tell to other villages as they traveled. A priceless religious object had been stolen and they wanted it returned. This enlisted many to help them by spreading the word of a priceless object that, if found, would make any who owned it rich. When the Russians explored your land, this story came with them. The explorers from the St. Peter knew of it. I believe they were looking for this thing and all the while it was under their noses with the young deckhand. So I tell you this story as a warning. This evil waits for someone to set it free. Its hatred has festered and grown stronger over the years. It has grown jealous of the demons. It hears playing around it and flying between the physical and invisible realms, taking souls and bodies it hungers to have. As evil can and does, it is waiting. It became a part of a tree, guarded the entrance to the inconsequential, by human understanding, piece of land you call cursed. Its rage and hunger grow daily. God help anyone who releases it. My story is done. Again, forgive me. May God have mercy on us all. Solak stood up. Wait, how do you know this? And why should my people believe you? I am Nicholas. I am the one who brought this curse to your land. The man called Solak dissolved into a white mist and vanished. If you enjoyed this podcast, I encourage you to share it with others you think would also be interested. If you'd like to know more about me, Go to M-A-R-Y-A-N-N-P-O-L-L dot com and or authormasterminds dot com forward slash M-A-R-Y dash A-N-N dash P-O-L-L. Until next time, may the wind always be at your back, the sun on your face, and the good Lord walk beside you.